Hey, hey, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. Man, you guys are lively. Well, that, that side's lively. I, I don't know about this one. All right, we're... Awesome. Hey, by the way, it's great to be back. We took a couple Sundays just to chill, and uh, Pastor Noah and Pastor Reverend Dr. Billy Bishop uh, Dore did a great job. Those guys are so amazing. Thank God for them. We're ending our series today uh, in Fascinate. We've been in that series for about eight weeks. And if you have your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to pray. Father, thank you for the word of God. Transform us today, Jesus, by truth, the truth of your word. Lord, I pray that you would touch every heart here. God, I pray that people would leave here with the destiny and the hope of you in their hearts. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was preparing for the message, and I was going to do um, the justice of God, because we've been doing the attributes of God. And I was in Los Angeles. We had to go pick some equipment up for the church, and it was evening, and everybody else had gone to bed, so I was sitting up, and I was like, I'm going to spend a little time with the Lord and just pray, read my Bible. And uh, so I started to pray and to prepare for the message, and as I was preparing for it, it just felt dead. You know, it just, it just felt like information. And I felt like the Lord said, I want to say something different next week. And I was like, oh, when well, you know when the Lord says he wants to do something, it's okay, right? You go, yes. You don't go, no, I got this, Lord. I, I got it. I got a good one. So there's three things that I felt like the Lord said to me about us as a church and in the, in the area of fascinating. And today I'm going to entitle this message, The Partnership of God. The Partnership of God. And it, we should be fascinated that the God of the universe, who created all things, who holds all things together, who is amazing, brilliant, unbelievable that he would choose to partner with human beings, that he wants to get stuff done. If you look in scripture, he always chose people to do something. We should wake up every morning being fascinated by, wow, God wants to use me today. And there's three specific areas I think the Lord wants to use us. Now there's many more, but these are the three I felt like uh, the Lord spoke to me about. So let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. <clears throat> and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal now, the, he's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to the church and saying this. But as to babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And, and now, even now, you are still not able. For you are carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are not you carnal, behaving like mere men? For when one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? Stop right there for just a sec. This is not the message. This is for free. But it's part of it. Paul was dealing with and confronting a competitive attitude that had risen up in the church. Their competitive spirit started rising up. Well, I'm of Apollos. Well, I'm of Paul. And they were all envious of each other and backbiting and divisive over, well, I go to Cornerstone. Well, I go to CPC. Well, I go to The Rock. Well, I go to wherever you just name it. Well, I'm of this guy. I'm of that guy. And Paul comes in and goes, hey, guys, I just want you to know something. Imagine Paul preaching. He, he wasn't like happy, happy. He was like, hey, guys, I just want you to know something. What you're doing right now is super carnal and very immature. Uh, you imagine that feeling that came over them? And he goes, you're being unspiritual right now in the way that you're processing the kingdom of God because you're processing the kingdom divisively, this church, that church, this church, and it is the kingdom of God that we are for. Amen? That's what it's all about. Listen, when, it, when the church, when we all die and we're in heaven, I guarantee you there won't be a rock section. <laughs> I promise you there won't be a section for Hillsong, even though they're cool. But there's not going to be like, oh, the Lord's, oh, you, you wrote that worship song? No, it's going to be the kingdom. It's going to be all of us going, yay, Jesus, yeah? yeah? Watch this, verse five. Who then is Paul? Paul's saying this about himself, by the way. And who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Verse 9, for we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. So here's what Paul's saying. Look guys, honestly, at the end of the day when we stand before God, that pastor's not going to matter. It's not going to be about that preacher, that pastor, that book, that 
that Christian ministry. Does God love that? Yes. Does he use it? Of course. He says right here, he goes, man, this guy gives the seed, this one waters, but it is God who gives the increase. Watch, Jesus is the centerpiece of who we worship and love. We're not in love with ministries, we're in love with Jesus. Yeah? That, that, they're quiet over there. It's whatever. God calls us co-laborers. That's what that scripture says. For we are God's co-laborers. Watch this. We walk with him and we labor with him. He's chosen us to do and build the kingdom with him. And he doesn't need to, but that's how he chose to do it. He doesn't have to use us. Did you know he could do it all by himself? He could do everything by himself, but he goes, you know what? I love these people. I'm going to use them, and and I'm going to choose them, and we're going to do stuff together. So here's the three ways that I think God wants to partner with us as co-laborers. Now, the first one, the first point is going to surprise you. It's going to blow your mind because in this church, we have never breached this topic before. Number one, he wants to partner with us in prayer. And now, for those of you that have been in church longer than two months, you know, this is what we talk about a lot. We should be fascinated that he hears us, that he listens, and that he does and moves at the sound of our voice. It's unbelievable. Where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Where two or more agree on anything, it is done by my Father in heaven. He's waiting and watching for us to pray. Now, Matthew 6, 5, Jesus is teaching, the, by the way, the disciples come to him and they say, Lord... Teach us how to pray. Out of all the things they saw Jesus do, this was what they wanted to learn. They didn't say, Jesus, can you teach us how to walk on water? That was crazy cool. (laughs) Lord, can you teach us how to cast out demons? Lord, can you teach us how to pray for the sick? Lord, can you teach us? This is what the request was. Lord, teach us how to pray. Because they saw something in the life of Jesus that correlated to the way that he lived, and it was his prayer life. 4.30 in the morning, the disciples wake up. They can't find Jesus. Where's Jesus? They walk around, Jesus! And he's off praying by rocks, seeking his father, and they see it morning after. You know why Judas knew where to find Jesus? Do you know why Judas knew to go to the Mount of Olives to find Jesus? He went to the Mount of Olives because that's the place that Jesus often went to and prayed. That was his prayer room. And so Judas knew that's where he's going to be, guys. He's, a, he's, a, he's crazy with the prayer stuff. And every day Jesus would get up and pray, and he said, I only do what I saw my father doing. And he got his marching orders in prayer, and he, and he went and did what the Lord asked him to do. God wants to partner with us. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, they say, Lord, teach us to pray. And this is what Jesus says to him in verse 5. And when you pray, that's how he starts it out. When, not if, There's an expectation from God for us to pray. And then Jesus goes on and he says, therefore pray in this manner. God's expecting you to come and get in his ear and let him hear your voice. He loves to hear the people of God. And when we pray, guys, things change because we're we're partnering with him. We were at dinner with some friends. Uh, We went to this nice Italian restaurant. I said Italian, Italian restaurant. In Lafayette, and a few of our friends that are here this morning, and we had this nice dinner. It's kind of a nice little, kind of a fancier like restaurant. It was beautiful, and I'm I'm sitting at the table with six people, and we're eating, and and uh, about 20 minutes in, 25 minutes, and I look over, I see this couple sitting together, and they're talking, and the Lord speaks to me about them, and I'm like, Lord, this is a fancy restaurant, <laughs> and in and out, this is much easier to do. Much easier to do. And so I feel like the Lord drops a scripture in my heart for them and says one word about them to me. So I'm sitting there the whole time. Now I'm quiet. Everyone's laughing and talking. Now I'm spending the next 20 minutes going, how am I going to do this? It's all fancy smancy. And there's, you know, and so I said, what I'll do is I'll get up and I'll act like I work here. <laughs> and I'll get up and I'll go over to their table and go, how was the food? How, how was your... How was the food? By the way, Psalms 55, verse 22, the Lord says, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. I'm standing there the whole time wrestling. How am I going to do this? So I go, I know, I'll wait for dessert. No one's unhappy at dessert time, right? So the dessert comes, and we pay our bill, and we're getting ready to leave, and we get up, and we're moving out, and the crowd is moving out the door, and I just take a hard left, and I go right back over to their table. It's a two-person table, nowhere for me to sit. 
I'm like, ah. So I, I shake the guy's hand. Hey, how are you? My name's Joe. I changed my name. <laughs> I'm a pastor at uh, CPC over in <laughs> and, uh, and I, and I, so I shook everyone's hand and, and I said hi to them and then um, I knelt down uh, awkwardly and I said, I don't know what you think about God. That's what I said to him. I don't know how you feel about God and the whole God thing. But I'm a Christian and I'm a pastor and I just want to share with you something that I felt like the Lord said to me tonight during dinner. And they're looking at me like, You hear God? <laughs> Cuckoo. And I said, um, Psalms 55 verse 22 says that the Lord carries our burdens and he sustains us. And there you're carrying, you're in a season of life right now where you're both carrying very heavy burdens and the Lord wants to be your burden carrier because that's what he does. And they kind of smiled and lit up a little bit. And I didn't know how to end it because <laughs> I didn't know if I should do an altar call. Close your eyes and bow your heads, please. <laughs> if you're here today. So I got up and I, I shook their hands and I said, bless you, bless you. And I, I went out. And I said, Lord, that was so weird. I don't know them. I don't even know if they know you. And he goes, it doesn't matter. Do I want to carry people's burdens? I want to be their burden carrier. They don't know me. They're going to know me. You don't know who's in their life, what Christians are in their life, who's praying for them, who they're surrounded by. You just be obedient. Now listen, if we don't have a prayer life, we'll never engage that way. Because we'll never listen. But if we have a morning prayer where we're like, Jesus, love you so much, Lord. I want to partner with you today in prayer. God, your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, use me today. And then you're sitting there just eating dinner and all of a sudden the Lord blasts you out of nowhere. And then you got to go do something like that. And how many of you, that terrifies you, the thought of even that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My own wife's like, ah. She knows when it's coming. Well, we, she goes, oh, he does this. He says to the people, he does this all the time. <laughs> on, on vacation, he does it a lot. Because I'm not, I don't live around those people. So I'm like, yeah, I'll go tell him stuff, whatever. <laughs> I had business cards made. It says Cornerstone Church. I just hand them out. <laughs> These guys at Cornerstone are weird. <laughs> Hebrews 7, verse 24. Two verses about what Jesus is doing in heaven right now. Have you ever wondered what Jesus is doing? What is Jesus doing? He rose from the dead physically, not spiritually, just spiritually. He rose from the dead spiritually and physically. He's, however tall, sitting at the right hand of the Father on the, on the throne. What is Jesus doing right now? What is he doing? This is what he's doing, Matthew 7, 24. But he, because he continues forever, this is talking about Jesus, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore... He is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. In other words, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, you can be saved all the way to the uttermost because you come through Jesus Christ. Watch this. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. Watch this in Romans 8.33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Jesus is making intercession for you right now. He's pleading with the Father. Lord, may they understand. God, may they get it. Lord, I pray that the kingdom would come in Danville. God, I'm asking for this family that they would be healed and broken. Lord, I pray for this guy who's, who's lost and broken and who needs you. God, let's find a way. He's always making intercession for us. And when you and I pray, we're doing the ministry of Jesus. We're doing what he's doing right now. That's why he says, come and agree with me. Come and seek me. Come and find me. Because listen, when you knock, the door's going to be open. When you come and pray and agree, stuff happens. The kingdom shakes. But when the church stays bored, when the church stays bored, nothing happens. Church happens. I want the kingdom, amen? amen. That's why the enemy fights our prayer life so hard. That's why the enemy fights. It's not glamorous, guys, and it's not flashy. It's hard plowing. I said to the Lord, we've been in this church now 
uh, six years in July, July 18th. We'll be the senior pastors here. Been here uh, seven years in November. I said, Lord, for six years, I feel like I've had a plow out and we've been, we've been plowing hard ground and it's hot and sweaty and gross and not glamorous. Can we do something different? No. And the Lord says exactly that. <laughs> About as fast as Ken just said no as the Lord said no to me. And I said, but it would be much more fun to just have a church where we have popcorn and Slurpees and we just have cute messages and nobody says anything to offend anybody and we don't talk about the hard stuff. Lord, where we're just yay, yay all the time. God, we could really grow this place if we would, if we would just, and the Lord's like, Whoa, hello, what? Prayer is not the most flashy, fancy thing. Matter of fact, if, if, you, if you're, my youth group that I had, we had 700 kids coming and prayer and worship and kids getting filled with the spirit and prophecies and healings and pastors would flock to the place to come and see what is God doing in this youth group. We had, we had, a, kid, we had a, a conference one time and hundreds of pastors came to see what God was doing and to get the recipe because that's what they all want. How did you grow this youth group? 750 kids. You guys ready for this? And they'd go, yeah, yeah, we're ready. Pray. Read your Bibles. And teach your kids to do the same. And let them fall in love with Jesus. That's going to change your place. And they go, oh. I wanted the ABC of how to do it. I want the quick and easy, fast and blow up, flashy, boom, boom. Can't we just bring in the best speakers? And I go, yeah, you can. You know, we could do it right here. We could bring in the best, best Christian author, speaker, and blow this church up, and people would be there Sunday, and wow, it'd be amazing, and then we'd go right back to our normal stuff because we have no habit of prayer. We just want the flash in the pan. We just want the poop, pow, pow. We want the, I don't know what poop, pow, pow is, but we want it. <laughs> and the Lord's like, yeah, it's hard sometimes, isn't it? To be called to partner with God in prayer. <sighs> Man, Lord, this is boring. Sometimes I come in here and pray, and this is why I say to the Lord, Lord, I'm bored. You go, you say that to God? He knows you're bored. You think he's surprised? Like, what? Yeah, Lord, I've been doing this for like years, and it's just hot and sweaty and gross, and I just, I just don't, I don't see anything happening. And the Lord says, just be faithful to contend. Be faithful to be with me in prayer. Just agree with my heart. Agree with what I want to do. And I just keep plowing, and all of a sudden, guess what happens? I turn around, and there's stuff coming up through the ground, and there's trees starting to grow, and there's something starting to happen. Why? Because we're being faithful to do something that the world says is stupid. Matter of fact, the church even says is is a waste of time. I've had pastors tell me, you have your church, you have your staff pray every morning in in the sanctuary? Are you paying them to pray? Yes, I am. I don't want a staff that doesn't pray. Thank you very much. Why? Because prayer is where it gets done. When you pray, there's an expectation from God. Amen? Matthew 26, verse 40 says this. Then he came to the disciples. Jesus is getting ready to be crucified. He's in his prayer room at the Mount of Olives. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into uh, temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Watch this. (laughs) Could you imagine you're in your biggest point of need, your homies, your 12 disciples. You go, man, I'm going to be crucified tonight. And they're like, oh, okay, we're with you, man. Let's do this. Isn't that the worst thing in the world when people say, we got your back, man, we're with you. First sign of war. There's Jesus, he's praying, man, he's heavy, he gets up and there's Peter laid out. (laughs) Jesus says, hey guy, really, you couldn't do this for one hour? Watch and pray, lest you fall into temptation. So prayer is the antidote for temptation. When we are out of the way of prayer, we are in the way of temptation. When our prayer life and our time with Jesus, if we just want normal Christianity where we just go to church, guy preaches a cute sermon, we feel good, we get a little shot in the arm, and then we're on our way to do our life, that is not the way Jesus has called any of us to live. Fed guys say, well, you pray too much. Just prayer stuff is just too much. 
I go, well, you show me a scripture in the Bible where it says we shouldn't pray. Prayer's too much. I'll show you hundreds of verses on David praying, on uh, Peter praying, on Paul praying, on Jesus praying. Guys, it's the way God has wired us. We're called to partner with him in prayer. Amen? Watch and pray. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. How many of you know that's true? Listen, my flesh, I wrote it down on my notes, flesh don't likey prayer. That's what I put. <laughs> my, my flesh no likey. It doesn't want to pray. And I'm easily distracted. That's why I come here and pray. I don't pray at home very much because I get distracted. I'll get up and go in my office and I'll start praying. And all of a sudden I'm like, huh, what is that right there? <laughs> What's that shiny object? And I pick it up. Oh, it's a nickel. I wonder how they make nickels. I'm going to Google how to make nickels. Two hours go by. I've watched 18 videos on how to Google. I haven't talked to Jesus yet once. And then I go, oh, Lord, bless my day in Jesus' name. Amen. I come here because I'm easily distracted. My flesh does not want to pray. Your flesh doesn't want to serve. Your flesh doesn't want to be engaged. Your flesh doesn't want to give time or money. Your flesh wants to be in charge. By the way, I'm going to give you some crazy stats. In America, 20% of the church does 80% of everything. Did you know that? 20% of the church does 80% of the giving, does 80% of the work, does 80% of the serving. Does, listen, we're setting up for VBS. 1,000 people are going to be here all week long. Hundreds and hundreds of kids. And you got seven people putting it all together. And I'm going, man, this is a problem. This, is, this isn't right. I'm, can, can, I, can I be a little intense for a minute? I asked the Lord, Lord what, what's going on with the 80%? Why is it only 80%? What, what's, what's up with this stat? And I felt like the Lord said, well, they just don't want to do anything. Because their flesh is in charge. Flesh is running the show. Their theme song is, take it easy, take it. If you're young, that's a song from back in the day. <laughs> I can't sing good, so you might not recognize the song. Guys, we're called to go beyond ourselves and lock arms with the king of kings and to do something and to pray and to see the kingdom come. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Luke 18.1, I'm going to finish off prayer real quick. This will be the longest part. I know that you would, that would surprise you, but this is the longest point. Luke 18.1 says this, and you can keep your Bible there because we're going to read this whole text in the next part. Luke 18.1, then Jesus spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Okay, for those that say you're not to pray that much, Jesus just said, how much should we pray? Always. That doesn't mean we're spiritually weird walking around like, just praying all the time and people try to talk to us, shh, shh, I don't know what size Coke I want, I'm praying, just, go away waitress, but it's the, it's the constant engagement with the Lord, it's constantly being engaged, it's me at the restaurant going, Jesus, what are you doing, what are you doing, see, I could just come here and preach a sermon, two hours a day or whatever it is on Sunday, and then step out of my pastor stuff, shut the door to being a pastor, and then just go do my life and just have fun. But that's not what I'm called to. I'm called to a relationship with God. So it's the constant, this, Lord, what are you saying right now? And the Lord will say, nothing, eat your food. <laughs> There's other times, Lord, what are you saying right now? Oh, I wish I wouldn't have asked. <laughs> because we're called to actually do something. Amen? Amen. First thing. We are called to partner with God in prayer. He loves to hear your voice. He loves to hear his church cry out to him, and he will respond. Number two, we're to partner in faith, believing. We should be fascinated that God has called us to believe. Uh, Billy and I were talking, and there's nowhere in Scripture where Jesus said, uh, show me your faith by your understanding. Do you know, all throughout the Old Testament, the New Testament, it's faith, believe, faith, believe, faith, believe. There's actually verses about you study so much of Scripture that you actually think that it's bringing you life, and Jesus said it doesn't because you, you refuse to come to me. So in America, we have so much teaching in America. I'm so thankful for the, I mean, there are thousands of Christian books. 
There are amazing preachers on TV 24-7. I am so thankful for that. But the problem in America is I think we've become a place where we think the more we eat and the more we know, the better we are. And I would say that we are overfed and underactivated. We know it. Right? The Bible says, show me your faith and I'll show you mine by what I do. So understanding is not the issue. Of course, we're supposed to understand. We're called to study the word of God. But we are called to have a faith that believes what the Bible says. Amen? Amen. Jesus said in in Luke chapter 18, 1 through 8, you can read the whole text when you get home. I just want to read the end of it. Because he's talking about the, the, the judge that won't help the lady, and the lady pesters him so much that then the judge finally helps. And Jesus says, I, my father's not like that judge. My father loves to listen to you. You don't have to beg him. And then he goes on and he says, hear what the unjust just said. Uh, and shall not God not avenge his elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with him? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? What a question that Jesus is asking. When I come back, am I going to find people that really know me? You know, there's a terrifying verse in, the, in Scripture that says this. Many, Jesus said this. He says, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, and he will say to them, I never knew you. Man, when I read that verse, every time I read that verse, you should see me. Here's what I am. Lord, are we good? <laughs> I just want in, Jesus. Like, seriously, open the ark and let me in. Hell is hot and it lasts all eternity. I'm out. I want you. Lord, please, don't let me be a casual Christian that believes because I said a prayer that everything's wonderful and I never have to follow you or serve you or die on a cross. Because Jesus said, listen, he goes, this, this is a crazy verse. Narrow is the way to me and difficult. Did you hear Jesus preach that? Nobody's preaching that on TV. Hey, guys, I just want to let you know. First of all, tithe, give your money. Second of all, narrow is the way to Jesus and difficult. Whoa. Narrow is the way and difficult. And some some guys want to make it so that it's just this huge, wide road and nobody ever has to repent or nobody ever has to forgiveness. Nobody ever has to deal with anything. We just say a sinner's prayer. We read the little one-minute thing a day, and then we move on, and we never have to get called to do anything that would make us uncomfortable because that's not who God is. And I'm like, really? God makes me uncomfortable all the time. Why? Because he's after my heart. He's after me. He wants all of me. He loves me that much. So guys, listen, we have to partner with him in faith. Will he really find faith on the earth? Well, how do you get faith? Some of you go, I don't know if I have faith. Here's how you get faith. Ready? It's right here in scripture. It's funny when you read your Bible. There's stuff right there. (laughs) Hebrews 12.2 says this, that we're to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. This isn't religious Oh, groveling on the narrow road. This is, Lord, I don't have faith. Come fill me with faith. You're the author of it, and you're the one who's gonna keep creating faith in my life and keep doing things in my life until the day I die. Lord Jesus, give me faith. If you don't have faith, ask him for it. Every little man has a little bit of faith in him. I believe that. God's given us the ability to believe. Romans 10, 17 says this. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now that context of that is people getting saved. If we don't preach the gospel, people can't get saved. That's the content. But listen, we're being saved as Christians. Do you know that you're saved going to heaven right now, but for the next 50 years, God's going to be sanctifying you, renewing your mind, healing you, cleansing you, making you free, and the way it happens is by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I know this point will blow your mind, but the way that we get faith is we get the word in us. If you're watching Oprah eight hours a day and you're not reading your Bible, look right here. You're not going to have faith. You're going to be trapped in the culture of the world. We're to partner with him in faith and believe what God is doing. Yeah? We're called to partner with him. He's the author and finisher of our faith. And I, I put this in here. I just want to read it the way I wrote it. God didn't give us his word just to be studied. But to build our faith so that we'll do what he said. He, 
I always get nervous when I'm at a conference or something and a guy gets up and preaches and he goes, listen, I studied this out in Hebrew and Greek. I studied this word in the Greek and I got something new to tell you. I, I, I always get nervous. I studied it in the ontological presupposes of the teleological systematic system in scripture. Whenever somebody starts like that, I'm always like, here we go. They're about to depower the word of God. Why? Because it's much easier to dismiss those hard sayings than to receive them and say, God, give me faith to believe for that. It's much easier to go, well, God doesn't do that today. So we take the razor spiritually and cut out. And I asked this one guy, really smart guy, I said, so who, who gets to determine what is today and what isn't for today? Who, do you, a group of you get together? Do a group of you all get together and like determine like that verse was for then and then the next verse is for now? Because that's weird to me, man. The church needs to be a church that believes the word of God and actually says, Lord, do it. Lord, I don't want to read about it anymore. I, I've, I've been frustrated before with the Lord, and you should be too. Lord, I read it, and I don't see it in my personal life. God, I want to see it. Give me faith. There should be a holy frustration in the church going, come on, Jesus, come on. There should be. There should be a holy frustration that says, Lord, you said we do greater things than you. I want to see that. So teach me how to get to the place. We're called to partner in faith. We're call, called to believe the word of God. Listen, I'm going to write a book. And it's going to have a really beautiful cover. It's going to be 1999, just so you know. And when you open it up, it's going to say this. Pray, read your Bible, do something. I love books. I love smart guys. I love listening to them. I love studying but there comes a point at which, when I first got saved, I didn't have a scholar sitting in my bedroom with me talking me out of things. I was dumb when I first got saved. I was like, hey, man, uh, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says we should go out on the streets and tell people about Jesus. Well, let's go. And me and my four hippie buddies going out on the streets, just finding anybody. Hey, come here. They're like, why are these hippies coming after me? Come here a second. I just want to ask you something. Do you know you're going to hell? By the way, it's the wrong way to start. It doesn't work. We, had, we, were, we, we were rejected for years and didn't know why. And then we started, and I said, maybe we should come in with the love first. Maybe we should come in with the, the love of the reward of God instead of the penalty. Oh, yeah, let's try that. Listen, we read in Scripture, we pray for the sick and they're healed. We didn't, we didn't have somebody telling us, well, that's not for today. You see, in the Scripture, in the Greek, in the Greek, in the Greek, in the Greek. So what we did is we just stood up and said, that's for today. Come here, man. Oh, you're sick? We're at school. Come here, dude. You're sick? What's going on with your back? Well, come here. In the name of Jesus, we declare healing over you. And the guy's like, whoa, hey, whoa, I feel better. Wow, they come to church, they get saved. It's easy. We overcomplicate it and overstudy it. And just go do it. Wow. I like it. <laughs> just want to make sure we're good. Yeah, we're good. Point three. We're called a partner in the harvest. We're called a partner in the harvest. I, I put right here, we should be fascinated that he's called us to grab the net. Every person in this room, you're called to do something in the kingdom. I don't care if you've been a Christian a week or, or 40 years. And Jesus comes to him and he says this. He says, <laughs> so they've been fishing all night. You've heard the story. And he, he's like, hey, guys, catch anything? Peter, the professional fisherman, says to the Lord, no, not a good night. Jesus says, well, if you go back out there and launch into the deep, throw your, you'll get a catch. Really? I just had to fix our bathtub. We had a problem. You know the little, the little handle? It broke off. How do you know it's not good? And so I was like, hmm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to YouTube how to fix a valve. It was a problem. Because you know the water that is outside that comes into your house? You know you have to turn that off? Before you take off the other part, <laughs> didn't know that. So I went to take it off, and the water started, tsh, and I knew, like, I backed off. Whoa, what's going on here? <laughs> Called a plumber. <laughs> Something's wrong with my bathtub. Listen to me. Would you rather have somebody do brain surgery on you who's read the book or somebody who's actually done brain surgery? I want the dude that's done brain surgery. Yeah, I read the book this morning. He YouTubed it. 
I can take your tonsils out. I know how to do it. I saw it on YouTube. <laughs> I'm going to do it. I want the guy who's read the book. And Jesus comes. He comes to the professional fisherman. He's probably going, I've already been out there, dude. There's no fish. But at his word, he said, okay, I'll do it. Goes out, you know the story, drops his net, catches a great harvest, comes to Jesus, and this is amazing. The Bible says it's the kindness and goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Jesus just gave him thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of fish. And he ran to Jesus and said, I'm a sinner, get away from me. And what did Jesus say to him? Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. I'm going to use you, you crazy fishermen, to build my kingdom. But here's the deal. Most of us want to stay in the shallow end. We always want to stay in the shallow end of Christianity. woo It's fun. This is fun. Yay! It's not how I kick. <laughs> Just so you know. Water's up to your ankles, and you're like, whoa, I caught a fish. It's a little minnow. And the Lord says, you know what? I, I, I really want to do something deeper in you, and I, want to, I really want you to go deeper in me, so let's come out a little bit. Come, come into the deep. I don't want to go into the deep. Why? Because it's scary out there. Uh, I'm with you. Think I'm going to leave you out there to drown you? No. So get up to at least your knees. See, a lot of us, we want to see the kingdom, but we don't want to go where the kingdom is and what's happening. We don't want to launch into the deep. We want to stay in the shallow and have the same results. I'm going to say something kind of mean. If you've been a Christian for 40 years and you're not experiencing the things of heaven, you might consider going a little deeper. You might consider going, I'm going to go out a little bit on a limb here. I'm going to get up and pray. I'm going to get up every morning. I'm going to spend time with Jesus. I don't care if it's 10 minutes. Lord, I just want you to do your work in me. God, whatever you want to do today, use me. God, show yourself to me today. Read the scriptures, pray it a little bit, and go on your day. And you'll start to see as you go deeper, the Lord takes you deeper. And the next thing you know, you're doing crazy stuff, like telling somebody at a restaurant, giving them a psalms, and they're looking at you like you're a weirdo. It's good. I loved it. I walked away like this. This is how I walked away from the table. I backed away, first of all. I wouldn't turn my back on them because they had knives and all kinds of... I, I, I just did this. Bless you. I felt like Nacho Libre. Bless you. And I went outside and my flesh was so angry at me. My flesh that is weak was going, what are you doing? You're going to look stupid. And my spirit said, you don't even know them. Who cares? Who cares? God's going to do something through that. Amen. And you don't got to be weird. Don't be a weirdo. <laughs> God doesn't need you to be weird. And what do I mean by weird? This is what, if, if I would have went up to him and said, hi, how are you? Hey, how are you? Rick Fry, Rick Fry, God bless you, Rick Fry. And the Lord would sayeth unto thee, <laughs> thou hast, isn't that weird we get King James in that moment? It's like, whoa, what happened to Rick Fry? Whose impression are you doing? No, it was just simply this. Hey, I just want to tell you that I'm praying for you, and God gave me a verse for you, Psalms 55, 22. You should really check it out. Um, the Lord wants to help you carry your burdens, and I'm out. Peace. That's it. He just wants you to go do Jesus in the world. He just wants you to carry Christ in you. And you go and you go, oh, that person's sick. Come here for a sec. Hey, can I pray for you? You don't got to be weird. Jesus wasn't. Look in scripture. He just, wherever he went, wherever he went, he just, oh, come here, you're sick. Oh, come here, you're tormented. Oh, come here for a sec. And he just spoke life and people loved him. They wanted him at parties. He wasn't weird. He walked in the power of the Spirit. Amen? Amen. Grab onto the net and cast it out. Launch into the deep. I, I, I finished my message with this in big giant letters. Do something. Just do something. By the way, today we're going to set up for VBS. <laughs> that's the one person that's been here for six months preparing stuff. So she's worn out, tired, and probably a little angry. Listen, look right here. 
just come and set stuff up. Instead of 10 people doing it for eight hours, 300 people do it for 20 minutes. It's grab the net, man. Well, that's not very important. I set stuff up and carry stuff. It's not, I'm, I'm more anointed than that. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. If you can't set up chairs and set stuff up, you should never preach once, ever. Seriously. I have guys come to me, man, I want to preach. I want to get up there and preach. I'm like, why? Why do you want to preach? It's not fun. It's hard. People are going to email you when you're done. <laughs> you're going to get yelled at. You're going to get called all kinds of names. You're going to be told you're demon-possessed. You're going to be told you're weird. You're going to be told you're over the top. They're not going to like you. They're going to leave your church. They're going to go to find another church. Why do you want to do this? Because you want to be the man. That's why. But you don't know that this isn't being the man. Being the man is setting up chairs. Being the man is... Go set something up for VBS. Being the man is greet somebody. Being that, that's where the kingdom is. The kingdom is in those places. This is fun. This is great. We get encouraged. But man, my life out of here, do you think I do this all the time? You think this is how I live? I could go in the mall. Excuse me. <laughs> Build the kingdom for a sec. Come around. I want to start today in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. <laughs> no. When I'm out and about, I'm just me. I'm just like, hey, man, what's up, bro? And I have people in stores and all kinds of places where I go. I have friends and the Golf Mart guys. We're all buddies. <laughs> they know me very well. I don't stand up and preach. I'm just like, man, hey, how's it going? Oh, man, I'm so sorry to hear about your mom. How many to be praying for you? Do something. Stop letting 80% of the people rest and be lazy and not build the kingdom but let yourself be part of the 20 and then let our church be an 80% church where people come in and go, whoa, these people are crazy. They all serve. Yeah, it's because they love Jesus and they want to build the kingdom. Amen? All right.